but just giving you a sense of um, you've got a, a film, you're developing it, and you really do need to think about the audience. And I can't stress that as, you know, I talked about that a little bit yesterday, but um, in terms of process, at every juncture, from the very conception of an idea, um, particularly in this world where people have to actually put their money in hand in their pocket and get money out and pay to see your film or pay to download and see your film. You really do need to know that that audience um, will want to see your film. And so uh, we did a very rigorous impact assessment at the beginning of the Frackman journey and that very much dictated how we made the film. So. Think about your audience. Who is it? Where are they going to see this film? Eventually they will probably see it on television if you go the theatrical financing model. Um, but it's, you don't have that kind of collegiate approach that you would have in television by having a commissioning editor and a team of TV executives working with you, such as these um, two examples that were given earlier. It is a much more um, fraught uh, activity to be working without the um, distributors peering in all the way through the process. They will look at your script, but then they really don't want to know about the project, whether it's a documentary or a fiction feature, until they see a rough cut. And it can be in te terribly frightening to go after all that money has been spent. I mean, you are supposed to send them, uh, you know, rushes on the way through but then rushes as everybody knows can be amazing and the end product of a film can be terrible and it's really that process of getting from your rushes through to the rough cut and managing your expectation or the expectations of the people that you're delivering to that is a very important part of best practice in terms of uh, producing and uh, so I just wanted to mention that. In terms of markets, not just the movie convention, in terms of uh, markets here, there's curated markets such as 37 South, which is part of the Melbourne International Film Festival. Um, and there are other sort of individual meetings that you can set up with distributors in Australia, um, some of whom are scattered, but most of them are in Sydney and Melbourne. And uh, you really do need to think about how you're going to put those pitch materials together that we talked about yesterday. And you really do need to do a lot of research about the people, individuals that you're going to be pitching your projects to. Um, because they're relationships that uh, are going to underpin the success of your business. And then, of course, there's the international markets because if you're putting a finance plan together for any documentary um, or feature film, you really do need to be thinking, as Matt was talking about today, the world is your oyster in a sense, and increasingly so. Um, you know, now with a feature film or a feature documentary, um, it's potentially, um, you know, open to you to set up um, a VHX platform or some other uh, platform uh, digitally and sell your film to the world from your bedroom, wherever your computer is that you're accessing that digital platform. So um, there's so many different opportunities. Obviously promotion and marketing is hugely important as well. But there, it's a whole new world for producers. In a sense, there's the potential to cut out some of the, the dead wood of the middle people. Um, obviously, the very, very leading uh, brand names in terms of distribution who get what you're doing and who are moving into the 21st century rapidly in terms of understanding how to get films out there, they need to be your best friends and we can't do without them. Trish, but um, can yeah. I just ask you a question? Yep. I'm just interested, when you're working with distributors yep. and, you, for instance, with Frackman, I know it would have yes. been different because you used Tug, but yes. if you've thought really carefully about how, who your audience is and how you're going to reach them. How much do you push that with the distributor? How much do you say you know what you're doing and how much do you try and enthuse them to go along with what you believe is the best? Well, method? I mean, I'd like to say kind of silence. I don't want to treat any person disrespectfully, but there's no one who knows your film better than yourself. So you go to a distributor being you know, as generous as you can and you obviously um, realise that they know their business. For example, they've got the contacts in the exhibitors, even though I go and work the room 
with the movie convention to make sure I know personally many, many um, exhibitors in this country. Without the distributor's passion for the film, all of the knowledge that you have about who the audience is and how you've worked the room in terms of the exhibitors is not going to count for much because they're, they're pushing to get the right slots for your film, just like a television executive wants to get a slot on television for your film. But um, there is absolutely no way that without the passion of the producer now and knowledge about delivering, for example, the, the paper planes, if there's an opportunity to go online and see any of the webisodes of promotion around how they cleverly instituted that um, process from the producers working very closely with Roadshow. So, you know, it, it's a real mixture, obviously. You need the distributor to be very much on board and understand what they're doing professionally. But the producer can just make the difference between a film working or failing. I think Dressmaker is another great example where very cleverly they had identified with a lot of research, and this is your work as producers now, it's no longer any good to even consider just handing over in the theatrical space. Um, and that's just a very small part of the rollout, but it is a critical part. Um, your film and just leave it with the distributor. You need to deliver to the distributor as many ideas and hopefully, in the case of Frackman, we delivered them Get Up and their huge membership base. We delivered um, many, many ideas um, and E1 were happy to go with all of that. It's just that then we became part of Good Pitch and we had a lot of philanthropy money that meant that we had an obligation to go in a different way, a different pathway. And E1 understood that and backed off and let us do it because we decided to tackle the New South Wales elections and put on many, many event screenings using the money we got from Good Pitch. And so that was going to be directly in competition with the com a normal commercial rollout. Um, so every situation is going to be different, but as producers, if we don't understand the way the markets work, if we don't identify who are the best distribution partners for us, if we don't deliver to them fantastic ideas based on our impact assessment that we've done right at the beginning of the journey, like with Frackman, before we started into our major development and major um, scheduling in terms of how we were going to finish and finish the filming, which you know was still a good part of the film at that point. We weren't even financing. We ha were still working through who the audience was, why we wanted to make the film, how we were going to roll it out to these special interest groups that we had identified were the major market for us, for the goal we had of trying to achieve not just making money, but making real change in terms of how the coal seam gas industry was working in Australia. We needed to shape that film a certain way and we needed to really think about how we were going to get it out there. And that dictated a lot of the decisions we made in the edit and in the way we then worked with distribution, either with ourselves as a team or with other, like Tug, to get that um, to an audience. And so that's the very different work that we're doing these days. Sharon's got a question. Um, to uh, the, you know, my eternal gratitude to Troy Lam at E1. He, um, we, we parted company in the nicest possible way because um, we just couldn't reconcile how we were going to do our own, um, you know, obligation to the good pitch support with the business model that E1 has, which is a very, very big company now. And so, graciously, Troy stepped aside to let us do something unique and a very different sort of um, uh, process than what would have happened in the traditional model. So there was no exchange of anything other than, you know, goodwill and, um, and just, you know, basically terminating those existing contracts. That would be quite a difficult conversation. It was a terrible time for all of us. Yes. Well, you know, again, negotiation and um, goodwill and respect have to underpin everything you do. If you can't find ways to negotiate solutions, um, 
it's going to be a hard road to be a producer because, you know, even... I think that's just business <coughs> across the board. It is, though, a, 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 a particularly um, key aspect of what we do because, you know, I don't send the writer in to do the negotiation and the writer would expect me to do the difficult thing because their difficulty is something I can't do and they manage their work, um, you know... It's one of the kind of basic things that we need to be able to... And you can't let time go by. I mean, it was very difficult. Um, I remember getting um, an email um, when I landed on a plane um, somewhere and I just found out this and I thought, goodness, this is going to be a really tough day today. But to, um, to, to his credit, Troy was fantastic about it. And then just the following up on this market, international markets, um, we couldn't get the right pre-sale, or not pre-sale, uh, um, basically distribution agreement for Frackman internationally because no one could see the value in an, in another kind of watered down in their their mind um, Australian version of Gaslands. So we went forward um, without any international money in that film, um, and then uh, I have constantly worked over you know before the film was finished and subsequently at film markets, building relationships with um, companies and reject after reject after reject. I only went for the best companies. I didn't want to go with a, a, a rubbish sales company anyway. And we needed a sales company to understand that we wanted to do something different, to model the same idea of the tug rollout in UK and US. And to, I think I mentioned this yesterday, and to be able to sell ourselves to the world, the digital version of the film. And it's taken a long, long time, but eventually when Frackman was named one of the top ten in the Guardian's list for last year of Australian films, I then, yeah. you know, again, persistence, never give up, went back to all the front runners, all the companies I really wanted, who were generally the first ones to have said no. Um, and this is probably two and a half to three years after com ongoing conversations and then hit them all up again with, you know, as your last chance. And I'd, we just assembled something about like five major doc uh, festivals around the world that were taking, you know, willing to take the film. And just a couple of days ago, we signed a deal with content in LA, content films, which are based in UK, you know, blue chip company, looks after all Alex Gibney's films. And we ended up with an auction between them and a leading UK company. And uh, it was such a good thing to finally get that yeah, done. Yeah, big congratulations. That's a massive. Well done.